Okay. It's um, 19 o'clock Moscow time, and I think uh, we should start now. Dear colleagues, I would like to wish you a merry upcoming Christmas and welcome you to the online course on East Caucasian languages, organized by the Linguistic Convergence Laboratory of the HSE University, Moscow, in Russia. My name is Konstantin Filatov. Uh, I am an I'm a student at St. Petersburg State University and a former member of the uh, Linguistic Convergence Lab. I will moderate today's session. Uh, this is the 12th lecture in the series of 13 entitled uh, Complementation in East Caucasian Languages. It will be given by Dr. Natalia Serdobolska. But as usual, before introducing our speaker, I will clarify some organizational issues. As always, the lecture will be recorded, live streamed uh, on YouTube and stored there afterwards. The lecture will go uninterrupted, followed by a question period. Those of you who are joining the lecture via Zoom will be muted throughout the session in the interest of the, of the lecture and uh, sound quality. You may send your questions via Zoom chat or YouTube live chat. I will collect your questions and at the end of the talk, I will share my screen with a list of questions for the speaker to ask them, answer them. them. So, uh, asking a question, uh, please use your real name. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Natalia Serdabolska, a senior researcher at the Minority Language Research and Preservation Lab of the Institute of Linguistic, Linguistics, Russian Academy of Sciences, and senior researcher uh, at the Pushkin State Russian Language Institute. Natalia Vadimovna's research interests include the semantics of complementation, typology of phrasing, nominalizations, uh, and the syntax of neck Dagestanian languages. Uh, she has done extensive fieldwork on various languages of Russia, including Uralic, Mongolic, West, and of course, East Caucasian languages. She's also an expert in differential object marking in the languages of Russia. As a principal investigator, uh, Natalia Vadimovna led the project syntax of non-finite dependent clauses. Dr. Serdobolska is a member of the editorial board of the Rema Journal and a member of so Societas Linguistica Europea. Her papers are published in several edited volumes, such as Inquiries in Verbal Derivation by uh, the Institute of Linguistics Press or Complementation uh, and New Challenges in, new challenge in Typology by Mouton de Gruyter. Today's lecture uh, will be dedicated to complementation in East Caucasian. Uh, Natalia Vadimovna, your lecture begins now. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and uh, I first must thank the organizers uh, for inviting me. And I think it's a very interesting and fascinating event, this course and lecture. So uh, now, uh, I start with, with the lecture uh, on complementation. And uh, let me first start uh, with, the, sorry, uh, with the definition, what complementation is. So um, in Nuna's work, um, uh, the complementation is viewed as a syntactic construction in which a notional sentence of predication is an argument of a predicate. For example, uh, if we look at the sentence from Sakur, uh, we see that uh, the predicate to be surprised uh, takes uh, an argument, a causal argument. Mother showed his brother to the doctor and this clause, mother showed the brother to the doctor, uh, is uh, actually uh, the complement clause. And um, so uh, the East Caucasian languages uh, use a large list of devices that can um, uh, mark complement clauses. Between them, uh, the infinitive or potentialis form in some languages, the Mazdar, which is uh, the nominalized form, uh, the participles, converbs, of different kinds, 
purposive forms. There are complementizers derived from verbs of speech, and um, many languages also have asynthetic subordinate constructions. So what is peculiar about uh, East Caucasian languages uh, is uh, first that uh, they use, they make use of non-finite clauses and complementation, where all the arguments are encoded in the same way as an in independent sentence. For example, if we look at this Tsafur example, uh, we see that uh, this clause, mother showed his brother to the doctor, uh, seems to preserve the same case marking everywhere as in a corresponding independent sentence. The mother in ergative, brother in uh, nominative or absolutive, and doctor in uh, effective case. And uh, meanwhile, the clause is nominalized. It takes the master marker, which itself takes uh, the case marking, uh, uh, the superlative, uh, assigned by the matrix verb to be surprised. So if we had Byron was surprised by a noun, right, by, by, by you, for example, it would take the same case marking as the master in this case. So um, this feature, uh, so I, I illustrated the first feature and uh, then uh, other interesting features uh, of East Caucasian are backward control, long distance agreement and complement clauses, a use of specific uh, pronouns, so long distance reflexive pronouns, or someone calls them logophores. Uh, then many languages make use of a specific effective form uh, and differentiate between uh, semantic types of complement clauses. And uh, there are interesting patterns of direct speech encoding. So um, I'm going to start with the syntactic phenomena and then uh, say a few words about semantic phenomena. So the first phenomenon I'm going to uh, show you is the backward control. Uh, backward control, um, uh, to understand uh, what, what is the backward control, we, we should first start with the notion of control that has been defined as uh, uh, constructions where non-avert subject of the infinitival complement has to be identified with a DP in a matrix clause, as uh, in this example, the girl began to feed the cow. So what is peculiar about um, East Caucasian, it, it is uh, that many of them uh, show uh, the have a structure that seems to be parallel to standard average European, um, like exemplified in English, but uh, vice versa. So in English, we have the NP in the matrix clause with the verb began and uh, the zero in the dependent clause. While uh, in many East Caucasian, we have the zero in the matrix clause as shown in this example from says, uh, and uh, all the argument positions are filled uh, in the dependent clause. So uh, the presumably uh, the noun phrase girl in the ergative should be identified with a zero in the matrix. So this is the, the analysis suggested by Polinsky and Potsdam in their work. And uh, so this uh, notion of backward control it seems to be um, is uh, generally opposed to forward control, which is exemplified in the English sentence. So um, when uh, encountering such examples, uh, first, uh, they can be encounter encountered in many uh, East Caucasian languages, for example, in Sakul, Beshta, Dargua, not only says, and uh, it seems that uh, many of uh, data uh, considered in Kibrick's materials to the topology of ergativity also fit this description. Uh, however, uh, we cannot say for sure because um, the notion of backward control uh, must, uh, uh, the, the, the 
the fact that the construction actually demonstrates backward control must be proven on the base of several syntactic tests, which I'm going to show below. So uh, what are the syntactic features of backward control in CES first? Uh, in CES, uh, the uh, matrix verb um, shows agreement with the ergative noun phrase in, uh, in, in the dependent sentence. Uh, so uh, with, with hunter in ergative here. And uh, as, as we know, uh, the, uh, uh, the general rule is that the absolutive argument must control the agreement. So uh, if we see uh, the uh, DP in the ergative case here, uh, th that suggests us that it could be in the dependent clause and not in the matrix clause. Uh, then um, what is uh, peculiar about this, but not, not uh, this is not a feature of backward control in all the languages I mentioned. It is the fact that it is impossible to put uh, this uh, now phrase into uh, the matrix clause. So it's impossible to mark it with the absolutive case and put it before the verb begin, like shown in the example here. And it is impossible to express both arguments simultaneously. So we cannot have, uh, she began to mow the grass with uh, the demonstrative in both clauses, in the ergative and in the absolutive. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the, actually, uh, uh, the peculiarity of says, but not of, uh, not of, for example, dark wall languages, which allow, uh, which allow both of the things that uh, are impossible here, are shown to be impossible here. Uh, okay, so if if we uh, return to uh, the uh, grammatical example, uh, then uh, what? Uh, what uh, possible analysis uh, can we offer for such an example? Uh, first, uh, we can, so uh, the backward control is just one of the possibilities. Uh, then uh, we could say uh, that uh, actually this ergative noun phrase is somehow uh, uh, in, in the matrix clause that uh, we actually have the word control and uh, the case is somehow attracted. So the case attractions happens from the dependent clause. But then another possibility would be to uh, think of this structure as a monoclausal uh, construction. So uh, that the verbs feed and begin uh, make up a complex verb that um, actually presents an example of clause union and uh, it possesses the single set of arguments and uh, this is why uh, we have such a such a uh, case marking on the noun girl. Uh, however, both uh, analysis, both the second and the third analysis are ruled out uh, based on a number of syntactic properties uh, that um, people working with backward control consider. Uh, for example, uh, we cannot, the, the, the monoclausal analysis doesn't go in line with the possibility of agreement uh, of uh, differing agreement patterns on the dependent verb and on the matrix verb. So on feed, we have the third class agreement and on begin, we have the two class, uh, second class agreement uh, which uh, would be impossible under complex verb analysis. Uh, then uh, why do people argue that uh, we don't deal with forward control here? Uh, that actually the ergative DP does not belong to the matrix clause. Uh, so the first uh, argument that I already mentioned is because it's an ergative and the verb begin does not 
a signed ergative in this language. The second uh, uh, piece of evidence comes from word order. So um, in these examples from Polinsky, it is shown that uh, the ergative DP can change positions with elements of the dependent clause. And there are two possibilities, actually. Uh, but it cannot uh, do so with the elements of the matrix clause. So we cannot put it after the matrix verb, uh, as in A. And uh, uh, actually, the same as we cannot put there uh, the noun gate in B. So both seem to depend, actually, uh, both noun phrases seem to belong to the dependent clause. Uh, then uh, another argument against the monoclausal analysis uh, comes from long distance agreement. So uh, in says the long distance agreement can only cross one clause boundary. So it cannot uh, be assigned uh, through uh, to, to the clause embedded in another embedded clause. Uh, thus, in the following example, uh, I know that your daughter began to receive money. Uh, we, we must say that um, a silent uh, absolutive subject is, uh, is here, right? Which is co-indexed with, with the noun girl. But if we don't, uh, if we don't postulate this, uh, then uh, we must explain how the long distance agreement in this particular example uh, happens across across two clause boundaries, unlike in uh, says in general. Uh, okay, so then uh, uh, some some uh, remarks are due on the semantic arguments of the matrix verb. So uh, in says uh, the verbs that uh, allow the backward, con backward control uh, actually don't allow idiom chunks uh, in the dependent clause. Like uh, in this example here, uh, the, this example shows the idiom, the darkness is the sun, and it, it's, it only allows uh, the straightforward reading, not non-idiomatic one, under record control uh, structure. So uh, that means that actually uh, the referent introduced by the ergative DP is the semantic argument of the matrix verb. Uh, okay, so uh, then, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's the previous slide. Okay, so these, these arguments are usually uh, drawn by people working on backward control to show that actually it is uh, a biclausal construction and that the ergative uh, DP belongs to the dependent clause and uh, to show uh, that it's the semantic argument of the matrix verb. So uh, now I'm going to consider briefly the phenomenon of the long distance agreement in East Caucasian, uh, which is defined as follows. Uh, so uh, the agreement in general is um, licensed in the same clause, uh, well, is expected to be licensed in the same clause uh, where, with, uh, where the controller at the target um, are uh, expressed. Uh, but uh, in East Caucasian, uh, and actually in, in, in all of them, uh, the constructions are attested where we find so-called long distance agreements. So the agreement ac across the clause boundary. Uh, for example, let's compare A and B. Uh, in B, we have um, the verb want, I want to buy dresses, agreeing uh, in class uh, with the clause. So I want uh, neutral. And um, 
it is also possible to uh, to have it uh, to have the plural agreement on this verb agreeing with the noun dress in plural as in a uh, and uh, it seems to be a, an agreement across the causal boundary because uh, the clause to buy dresses uh, is um, we have a bi-clausal structure with two clauses, I want and to buy dresses. And uh, the dresses don't belong to the same clause as the verb want. What, that's why uh, people uh, are calling this long distance agreement. And uh, it is attested in many languages. Uh, it's attested in many languages and uh, the following uh, questions arise when uh, analyzing these constructions. So first, is the construction by causal? Maybe it is just one and the same clause, so the same hypothesis as with backward control. And that's why uh, the verb want has dresses as its argument. Okay, so the second question, is the NP in question syntactically in the dependent clause? Maybe it is raised into the matrix, like in the English example, I believe him to be honest. Like him uh, gets its case marking from the matrix verb. Uh, then uh, the next question is, maybe the NP in question does not raise to the matrix clause, but it is originally the argument of the matrix verb. So maybe the verb want is such that it requires uh, such a, uh, an interesting uh, argument structure. Uh, so, uh, why uh, the monoclausal analysis should be rejected for this particular case? Uh, so, I'm discussing here uh, the Kunki Dagwa, Dagwa data, not uh, East Caucasian in general. So, for Kunki uh, Dagwa, uh, the monoclausal analysis does not hold because, uh, for example, uh, it can uh, this construction can have uh, two time expressions referring to different periods of time and it, they don't contradict each other. So, father ordered yesterday son to buy shoes today, and uh, this construction uh, also holds uh, LDA just as well as uh, the verb begin. Uh, and uh, still, uh, it, it allows, uh, at least semantically, two situations that exist independently of each other. Uh, then, uh, the raising analysis uh, could be postulated for um, Dagwa on the basis of several syntactic um, arguments. One of them is uh, the ellipsis of a group of words. So uh, this is a pretty long example, but we should concentrate on B here, which is of most, most interest for us here. So uh, the mother has to, and the sister doesn't have to watch Murad. So uh, if we want to drop this watch Murad in the second sentence, and the sister doesn't have to, uh, then uh, the long distance agreement is not um, actually grammatical and the speakers prefer the variant uh, with the local agreement as in A here. So that seems that by local agreement uh, to base Murad forms a constituent while by long distance agreement as here uh, to watch Murad does not form a constituent. Uh, and that seems to show that uh, Murad actually raises uh, to the matrix clause. Uh, and that's why it can assign uh, agreement to the matrix verb. And there are several other arguments for this analysis. Then uh, there are tests that prove uh, that it's not a control structure so that uh, the null phrasing question is not originally the argument of the 
metrics learned. And um, to use this, uh, the, the same idioms tests is uh, used as uh, we have already seen uh, for backward control. But uh, I must say that um, the East Caucasian languages do not show a uniform structure of long distance agreement. Uh, so uh, there seem to be um, two uh, types across all uh, East Caucasian languages. So uh, in the first group, uh, the clause union verbs uh, are used uh, in these constructions and it is limited to uh, the phasal model uh, and some other verbs uh, that usually don't um, introduce their, uh, an independent situation, but uh, modify the situation expressed uh, in the embedded clause. And uh, the same happens in the Kunke Dagwa examples uh, I showed. So it seems that it's not simply raising there uh, that takes place, but the raising from, from a construction uh, that is uh, um, with a, that has a weakened clause boundary. Uh, and uh, for, for, for other languages listed here, um, it seems that, um, so for, for most of them, uh, the LDA construction is the only one possibility to mark um, the corresponding arguments. And uh, for those who do have two constructions, two possibilities, local and long distance agreement, no apparent semantic difference is, difference is um, given in the sources that discuss the construction. Uh, However, uh, if we look at the data of CES, Hinokhwarshi, Sahur, we see quite a different type of constructions. So there, uh, the LDA happens with mental and emotive verbs uh, and uh, with the strategies that, uh, that uh, do not show properties of close union. So it's something like, I know that Rasul has been here. And uh, I, I saw that Rasul has been here. Uh, and uh, for these languages, quite uh, a different pattern is observed. So uh, for the languages of the first type, uh, the LDA construction uh, is uh, attested with the infinitive mostly and converbs. While with this type of verbs, and with these languages of the second type, we see the Mazdar or the S-like so-called type. So uh, the, the, the type when there's a, a full-fledged uh, clause with all arguments expressed and a, a complementizer. Uh, and for these languages, the authors state, um, the authors of the grammars state uh, that uh, there is a semantic difference between two constructions, between local and long distance agreements. So uh, the NPs triggering long distance agreement are topical uh, in, in some state and some authors uh, um, uh, take uh, the notion of emphasis to explain this. So uh, there seems uh, that it, so it seems that information structure status of the NP uh, is relevant for the choice of the long distance agreement constructions uh, in the second type. Okay, so um, the first type uh, can be uh, referred to as Godobiri type. Uh, because uh, it seems to that, that in Godaberi, uh, the clause union actually is uh, without any doubt, doubt um, what we uh, must postulate for this structure. So it's, it's not this uh, hybrid raising uh, uh, with a weakened clause boundary as in Dagwa, but it, it is straight close, a straight example of clause union because uh, it uh, 
uh, it, it shows um, because as in uh, husband mouth grammar, it is, it is shown that uh, both verbs, uh, the embedded verb and the matrix verb uh, actually share the same uh, number of arguments and um, uh, the uh, some, some morphosyntactic features um, that and this sharing cannot be explained unless um, we assume the um, close union analysis. And uh, the second type, the second type could be referred to as success type, uh, because there it seems that we have a full-fledged uh, dependent clause. Uh, and the entry in question uh, well, in, in Polinsky analysis moves to this position to agree to, to sign agreement to the to the matrix verb. Uh, so um, these are the, the maturing uh, types. But I must say that uh, for most languages um, listed in the first type, we don't have enough data. Um, to be sure that it, it is exactly cause union and nothing else. Uh, okay, so the next uh, topic I'm going to consider uh, is the semantics of specific complementizers in East Caucasian. So, Well, I, I must say, uh, I must first introduce some uh, semantic notions that are going to be relevant for the discussion. So um, first, uh, what is relevant here, it's uh, the distinction between facts and propositions. Uh, and um, uh, this is shown uh, in the examples with the verb know and believe in many languages, uh, they behave like that. So. Uh, if we say he knew that Smith was a murderer, in many languages, um, it's in Russian, for example, it wouldn't, it would uh, presuppose, be presupposed that it is true that Smith was a murderer. And if we negate the sentence, still uh, the truth of the dependent sentence is taken for granted. So it, it does not change its truth value. Uh, and this truth value does not depend uh, on the negation uh, of the matrix verb. So for, for many languages, uh, for, for English, uh, there is some counter evidence, but let's, let's, let's omit that for now. Uh, so uh, the verbs like believe, so these, these sentences like this are uh, referred to as facts and uh, they are opposed to propositions uh, that um, uh, are uh, attested with, with verbs like believe, think, etc. So if we say he believed that Smith was a murderer, it may be true or not, uh, depending on many, many, many um, subjective um, evidence. And if you say he didn't believe that Smith was a murderer, it still may be true or not, it, it still depends on many factors. So um, we don't have any anything that's presupposed or taken for granted. And this negation test is usually uh, the, the major test used for differentiating between facts and propositions in many languages. Uh, then uh, uh, then uh, the second uh, uh, very important distinction is the distinction between propositions, including factive propositions. So facts are sometimes called factive propositions, propositions versus events. Uh, so the difference is that the events are perceived by the senses and located in space and time. So if we say something, you know, his coming happened, that means that uh, this is an event, his coming. Uh, while propositions are information units. Uh, they cannot happen or take place. Uh, and propositions can contain negation, unlike events. So uh, we cannot, so if we say uh, he's not coming happened, uh, that, that, that sounds rather peculiar. 
Uh, and also propositions can host uh, epistemic expressions uh, like events. And it seems that in many East Caucasian languages, uh, this difference uh, between facts, propositions, and events is important for the choice of the complement encoding. For example, uh, see the sentences, uh, the subword sentences here. Uh, the uh, perception verbs uh, are uh, usually taken by, uh, I, I usually taken as an example of differentiating events from propositions because um, something perceived directly by the senses um, is, uh, um, uh, is actually event. And uh, also the perception verbs in many languages can uh, can be used to encode knowledge-based um, uh, inference, something like heard from the neighbors that the donkey can shout, someone told him, or if you see, say, uh, I see that, that you are here, I see that you're not ready for the lesson. It's not a thing that you can actually see, but uh, it's a thing that you can infer based on some uh, information and some, some behavior of, of, of the person discussed. Uh, and uh, actually, you, you can see that in Sakur, as argued by uh, Lutika Obonchis Molovskaya, uh, this difference in the context of perception verb is encoded uh, by different um, complement clauses, so complement types. So, uh, the complementizer where is used uh, to encode propositions in B and in A. Uh, uh, yeah, while well, in A we actually uh, have another strategy. So uh, now, I'm sorry, <laughs> so I'm turning to the same place. Yeah, uh, so we must say that in um, standard average European languages, uh, there are complementizers uh, that don't differentiate between facts and propositions and can be used in both cases, uh, like that in English or Sto in Russian. Uh, but for many um, East Caucasian languages, uh, this uh, is not the case. So uh, this difference is relevant for the choice of the complementation strategy. For example, for Bagwalal, uh, Kalinina suggests that all the three are differentiated uh, and uh, all the three, three semantic types. And uh, she shows that uh, the verbs uh, of thinking and speech verbs most often take um, the quantitative particles. There are several quantitative particles. Uh, then, uh, that, that's what we see in the first example. If we don't move, they will think that the ballet does not reach here. So um, we see that it's not effective and actually it's false, that the complement clause is false, but it's uh, and it is encoded uh, with the body particle. However, uh, if we introduce a fact, uh, Ali didn't like it that the girl ran away from him, uh, we use the participle. And uh, it is indeed a fact here because the negation of the matrix verb does not change the truth value of the, the clause, the girl ran away from him. So he, he liked it, he didn't like it, but whether we use, uh, whatever we use, still uh, the truth value is preserved. And uh, the participle is used here. Uh, then, Uh, then uh, the Bag Bag Bagwalal has a uh, uh, Mazdar that uh, is mostly used to encode events. So uh, if we compare the previous sentence, didn't like it that the girl ran away from him, with this sentence here, didn't like the way Rasul brought him away, then um, uh, here the, the uh, object of not liking is not uh, the fact that the situation has taken place, but it's the situation itself and its proper characteristics. 
So the way the situation was driven, the way even I inserted this, the way in the translation, although um, in Russian it was hack, and uh, it, 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 it showed the difference between the two constructions. Uh, and uh, moreover, in Bagvalal, uh, the uh, events uh, are encoded, uh, maybe encoded differently from generic events. So uh, if you uh, want to um, refer to an event that happens regularly, and uh, like, like in the next example, Ali didn't like the way, oh, I'm sorry, he didn't like his father singing, I'm sorry, this is the wrong, the wrong translation. Uh, so Ali liked uh, his father singing. And this, this refers to the situation of singing uh, habitually taking place and not to a particular case of singing yesterday or today. And then uh, the speakers prefer to use the genitive. And uh, if we discuss a particular case like Ali didn't like the way Rasul drove him away. Uh, then uh, the uh, ergative case, or uh, yeah, is, is preferred. So uh, the uh, differentiation between facts, propositions, and events is also relevant for Kumpi Darwa. Uh, so uh, it seems that Mazdar is most often used to encode facts. Um, Although not always, um, like in this example, I know that you're not ready for the lesson. Uh, while the complementarizer Ible uh, introduces propositions. So with no, we have the master, and with think, in the second example, we have the complementarizer Ible. Uh, and it is interesting that the master can take negation, right? Uh, you're not ready, it takes negation here. Unlike the converb, and uh, if we remember, uh, the, the negation is uh, uh, the uh, feature that distinguishes facts from events in general. So events in Kunki are encoded, um, often encoded by the con simple proverb, like here, I forgot the way we used to walk along the river. Uh, and uh, uh, it is used with uh, the perception verbs and uh, verbs like remember and forget in this particular sense. Um, and with uh, in, in this minimal pair, it is opposed uh, to the master, right? So we have two, uh, two, two cases uh, with the verb forget. In the first case, uh, the speaker refers to the nostalgic, um, uh, rem rem yeah, nostalgic remembering, and uh, actually, it's not the fact that he forgot, but uh, the circumstances of uh, the walking along the river. While in the second example, uh, it is the fact that is important, and he, he forgot that it is holiday, and that's why he came. To work, for example, so that that can be uttered uh, in such a context, and uh, that's why he prefers um, to use the master here and the converb in the first example. So um, the this differentiation uh, I'm discussing here um, is not um, actually uh, discussed in all the grammars, and I, I must say here that. Um, it has been uh, maybe ne ne neglected by um, uh, some authors because, uh, well, uh, actually, uh, what we find uh, in many grammars is uh, that uh, they start from the list of the complement taking verbs and see that uh, there are many verbs that take nearly all the strategies. And uh, and um, they are reluctant to postulate uh, maybe a, a particular semantic explanation for this. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, looking at these examples and looking uh, and trying to generalize, I can say that uh, maybe 
uh, more attention should be paid to this. And uh, for example, uh, let us let us uh, see let us see the examples from Quarsh. Uh, it seems that uh, uh, if we look at the list of the verbs uh, given in Zaira Halilova's grammar, um, we see that it uh, the verbs that take the participle they only include active verbs. And uh, the context uh, that uh, she gives as examples are only seem to be factive. So, for example, Zainab knew that her brother came back. So the participle used here. Uh, and this is opposed uh, to the use of uh, the quotative uh, with, with a verb like think, consider, believe, and speech verbs. So this, this seems to correspond to the opposition of facts and propositions. And uh, also Zaira Halilova explicitly states that the quantitative cannot be combined with the knowledge verb to know. Uh, then for Hinuk, uh, Diana Porker uh, uh, calls a spe specific verbal form abstract. But this form is used uh, with verbs of knowledge, uh, verbs like understand, forget, and remember, and hate, and perception verbs. So the first, uh, the start of this list, verbs of knowledge, understand, forget, and remember, seem to point towards the effective uh, interpretation. And it seems that actually that uh, all the examples considered by Diana Porter conform to this hypothesis. Uh, she also says that they are possible with perception verbs, but uh, I must say that it's not a contradiction because um, perception verbs are tricky. They allow uh, all the three types of complements uh, and uh, not only events, but also propositions and facts. Uh, and um, maybe this is the explanation why uh, this verbal form can be used with this uh, this type of verbs. So maybe it, it, it would be uh, appropriate to say that abstract encodes facts actually in complementation. Uh, then um, th there's another uh, uh, thing that uh, is um, peculiar about um, East Caucasian is that uh, the perception verbs often take converbs. So many reference grammar uh, list them along with knowledge predicates. But then uh, here and there you find examples when the converbs are used uh, with this type of verbs. And maybe uh, for some languages uh, it, should, uh, it, it should be paid more attention. And for example, uh, John and Nichols uh, explicitly states that converbs can be used uh, in English uh, to, um, to encode uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, complements of the perception verbs, like here in these two examples. And it seems that uh, this actually uh, corresponds to the perception proper, not to the uh, knowledge perception not to the inference um, semantics of these verbs. So it seems uh, that um, the converbs, uh, like in Konki um, and are used here um, to encode perception uh, proper with perception predicates. So uh, now uh, I, I pass to the next topic, which is indirect speech encoding. And uh, I, I will show what is peculiar about indirect speech constructions in uh, East Caucasian. So uh, first, let us start with the opposition of uh, quantitative particles to complementizers. So uh, as we know, uh, the, prescript the prescriptive norm of standard average European is to have the indexical shift of the exit pronouns and adverbs with the subordinators. If we have a sentence, he said I was here yesterday, which we should change it into, he said that he had been at this place the day before, if we have a complementizer of that. And if we don't change it, we have some kind of a particle 
uh, like Tipa in Russian or the like construction in English. He was like, oh, I was here yesterday. And there you don't change anything and um, the pronouns and adverbs correspond to the form they had in the first sentence. Um, so uh, in East Caucasian, what, what is striking for uh, in East Caucasian, it seems that uh, the same complementizers are used with both types of constructions uh, in all the languages. And um, uh, it is exemplified here. So we have the first person, sing uh, first person plural uh, in the first sentence. Uh, and uh, we have the deactive chief in the second sentence. This, which of them is most talented? So the Han asked, which of you actually is most talented? This is changed into third person. Uh, then uh, what is interesting uh, that uh, there are special uh, pronouns. Uh, yeah, uh, there, there, there is opposition. Uh, the opposition of the uh, pronouns to special uh, logophores, as uh, many people call them, or uh, specific reflexive markers, third person reflexive markers, uh, as other people call them. Uh, so um, the reference uh, to the matrix clause subject can be encoded uh, by the first person singular uh, pronoun, as in this example, as, right? And it, in, it can be encoded by the logophoric pronoun uh, in English, right? And uh, um, the uh, construction with the logophor has been analyzed by many um, specialists as semi direct speech. Uh, based on the following um, syntactic properties. So uh, first, uh, it, it's, it's a mixed construction involving uh, both uh, a first or second person marking as here on the verb. So John and Nichols st states that this is one of the few verbs that uh, take the agreement markers. And uh, in that case, the first or first to second person agreement occurs uh, in the same context with the log of force. So we, we have it, uh, he implored me to lend me money. So uh, he implored me, lend me money. And this me is co-indexed by, um, um, uh, with the log of four and with the, the, the first person here. Uh, and, um, Actually, this presents a challenge to most of the uh, syntactic analysis and uh, suggests that we have to deal with this, with this kind of mixed uh, direct to indirect speech, so semi-direct speech. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the term uh, that many people use for such constructions. Uh, then, uh, Another another piece of evidence uh, for such a mix comes from deictic prefixes. For example, uh, in English, uh, this deictic prefix "qua" uh, indicates uh, the first uh, the the, the uh, direction toward speaker, so toward first person, person. And at the same case, we have the log of four here with the dative, and these both are co-indexed, which seems to contradict. Um, to, to be contradicting evidence. Uh, okay, uh, then, uh, but um, yeah, but I must say that not, not uh, all the authors are unanimous with respect to uh, the analysis of these constructions. So many uh, argue that it is actually the uh, direct speech construction, just uh, what the, the difference is, is in the, in the use of a log of four because all other characteristics remain to, um, as in a direct speech construction. So this is a point of debate and um, in many languages. Uh, 
then uh, the next interesting feature is the use of the imperative in indirect commands. So most uh, of East Caucasian um, languages use the imperative to mark commands with speech verbs. Like in this example, the neighbor went asking to let the girl go outside with her. So, uh, so the neighbor went, um, let the girl, uh, let the neighbor went like, let the girl with me, right? Uh, and uh, see here that uh, the imperative is uh, possible in the same cause uh, with the third person uh, pronoun here, the demonstrative here, uh, referring to the neighbor, right? So uh, we have actually, as, as we have seen above, we see a mix of the um, direct and indirect speech features, the imperative being the direct speech feature and the demonstrative pronoun here being a, an indirect speech feature. Uh, so um, the next interesting feature is attested in Agul, Archi, Wagwalal, Hinuk, maybe in other also. Uh, so this is uh, the possibility of a quantitative marker uh, that uh, may function as a matrix predicate itself, having its own arguments. So if we consider this sentence from Agul, uh, dad said one well, with milk the cow. Uh, we don't have the verb say here. We only have the quantitative marker I, uh, which uh, introduces the speech situation somehow. And it functions both as a complementizer uh, and as uh, the speech verb here. Uh, and uh, we have here two NPs, father and mother, in the ergative. Uh, which uh, means that um, somehow this uh, morphological marker, quantitative marker, has its own uh, argument structure and because it can assign uh, an ergative and can introduce its own argument, the speaker father here. The same is, um, similar construction is observed in Archie where the quantitative also has its own paradigm. So it has a converbal form, for example. Uh, and it's also, it also can introduce uh, the agent argument and the other C. As here, we have zoom zoom to, to me. Her husband uh, brought the cow, said, right? We don't have the verb say, but we have the quantitative here, uh, introducing uh, the agent of the speech word and the addressee to me. Uh, okay, the next interesting feature is the parenthetical use of the verbal speech. Uh, so many languages allow some kind of a uh, construction similar to Russian grid, um, where after each chunk of the information, uh, you have the verb said, said, said. Uh, inserted uh, and um, in the narratives, it, it is quite common. Uh, okay, so uh, I still have some time to uh, take on the next topic. This is the last one. It is the indirect question encoding in East Caucasian. So um, there are um, Typologically frequent patterns of uh, indirect question encoding, which I'm not going to uh, exemplify. Uh, and uh, they are pretty well attested uh, through uh, several East Caucasian languages. For example, uh, polar questions, he's asking if you are here, are often encoded uh, by the quantitative marker plus the interrogative particle or morpheme. Uh, here you see the list of languages. Just the interrogative particle in English. Conditionals like in English, if you are here in lesbian. Uh, the constituent questions uh, of the type, he's asking who you are, 
are often encoded uh, by the WH word uh, with the quantitative marker and sometimes in some languages also with the interrogative particle. Um, then it can be just the WH word and, uh, without any specific uh, marking of a direct question and uh, conditionals as well in Lesbian. So that, that uh, Lesbian uses conditionals in both types. Um, so these, these patterns are well attested uh, in many languages of the world. Uh, but there are also very uh, interesting patterns uh, that uh, are more limited uh, in, in cross-linguistically. So first, uh, what we see is a two predicate construction in Slesgian. Um, in the sentence, no one has been able yet to prove conclusively whether Homer existed in reality or not. So um, in this example, we have this um, popular with the question particle, uh, did exist, did not exist, uh, like the English or not, if you whether he, he came or not, uh, and uh, it it seems uh, to be quite uh, well used to, to encode uh, um, the pol polar question type. Uh, and uh, I, I must say that um, uh, actually this construction uh, is uh, widespread in uh, Altaic languages. Uh, and in, in the neighboring Turkic languages. Uh, and um, actually, um, it, it's also used in English and in Germanic languages and in Russian. So it seems not to be a rare topological patterns, but pattern. But the problem with this pattern is that many um, um, authors of the grammars don't describe it saying that okay, this is just the repetition of a predicate uh, or considering it to be um, not um, important enough and not thinking of it as a construction. And I'm not sure about Lesgian, so uh, uh, this is just one of the examples and it should be uh, uh, checked uh, whether this is actually a construction which is frequently used or is some kind of marginality. Uh, and, uh, but, but still, uh, it seems that it's one of the possibility, even if marginal, to encode this meaning. Uh, another, another less frequent construction is the attributive, which is attested in Dharma languages uh, situated nearby uh, all through all the three varieties. Uh, listed here. Uh, so uh, in, for example, who uh, father asked if we are going, uh, we have this uh, marker la, which seems to be uh, composed of the attributive plus the genitive marker. But um, well, the, the marker la is the same, is uh, similar to the genitive marker la, but it's not, um, of course, um, it, it, it's not uh, yet uh, uh, clear whether they have the same origin or not. Uh, but it seems that the first part, this L, is, uh, comes from the attributive. And uh, this, the attributive in L is also used in Konki and Ashti. Uh, then um, rare patterns are nominalization plus the WH word which is attested in says. So uh, the mother asked what the children saw is encoded uh, by a nominalized construction and the WH word inside it. Uh, then uh, the rare patterns. Uh, Sahur has a specific dubitative particle, which is only used in complement clauses. So it, it's, it cannot be uh, uh, called uh, dubitative because it seems to be uh, ungrammatical, as the authors write. It is ungrammatical in independent sentences and it is only possible in complements and only in this particular context. So it's not possible with the verb ask, 
but just with a, with a small subtype of embedded questions uh, of doubt, like wonder, with verbs like wonder, doubt, or, or not remember, not know, not sure, etc. Then um, the actually the most striking patterns are Rutul and Achi. So Rutul, uh, the Rutul uh, data comes from the recent work by uh, Nina Dobrushina and Alexandra Konovalova, who uh, describe its use in uh, uh, the, the use of the counterfactual marker in um, the uh, in uh, embedded questions. So uh, the first sentence here shows that it's a counterfactual marker. If Said moved across, I would have stayed at home, but he didn't, so I didn't stay at home. Uh, and uh, in the second example, uh, you see it used uh, as a marker of um, uh, of um, an embedded question. I didn't see when a wolf came. Together with a wh word, it is on on the dependent verb here and uh, actually introduces the embedded question. And uh, that is quite challenging because uh, it seems that uh, the, the situation, the, the, the two meanings, counterfactual and uh, embedded question, do not have much in common. But still, uh, it is used here in U2, uh, and it's the main part of the coding uh, embedded questions. Uh, then another very, very uh, interesting pattern is attested in Archie, and it is considered. Uh, in uh, Chumakina, Chumakina's paper, uh, and uh, it is all it, it is a special uh, verbal form, uh, the verificative, uh, which uh, can be used without an overtly expressed matrix verb. Uh, so uh, in this sentence, you wait, I said, and see what I say to my mother. Uh, you don't have C. Uh, we, we, we don't have the verb C. We just have wait. I said, uh, my mother, what I'm going to say. Uh, and the, in, in this verbal form, uh, somehow uh, the meaning wonder or C or uh, yeah, it, it is encoded. So uh, this um, suffix here. Uh, licenses its own arguments, as uh, is shown in the next example, uh, just as well as the quantitative marker we also um, have seen in Archie before. And um, this is uh, exemplified here. So we have the ergative noun phrase, uh, um, the first singular ergative. I will check whether she puts on a headscarf. So we don't have the verb check here, but we have this verificative marker. Uh, and uh, it assigns uh, the ergative here to, to the first person singular, so uh, the agent of checking. And in, the, in this uh, clause, we have just one finite verb, but uh, we have two ergatives. One of them um, denotes the agent of checking, and the other one denotes the agent of putting a scarf, a headscarf. Uh, so uh, this construction seems to be bicausal, uh, even if uh, only one verb is at sight. Uh, and as well as the quantitative, it, it also has a reduced verbal paradigm uh, and uh, seems to be a kind of uh, a verb. So this uh, verificative mark, you can inflect uh, for some, some categories. Uh, so um, this, this marker is used to mark both polar and WH questions. So uh, uh, this ends the section on, yeah, on indirect question markers. And actually, I have come to the end of the talk. And I must thank the audience for 
listening and here you can see the references. So, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, now I will share, share my, sc my screen so that everyone uh, can see the questions. Uh, does uh, anyone see the questions? Well, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, uh, we can start uh, a discussion part. Mm -hmm. so should I read the question or uh, are you going to? Yeah, yeah. Ah, I, I read that aloud, right? Okay. Mikhail Zubov. Does backward control correlate with proposed position of complement clauses as opposed to the closed post position in languages like English? Um, well, actually, I, I'm not ready to answer that question. I, I think that in my Dagua data, yes, um, it, it, it was. Uh, and But, but it's not um, the proposed um, position was not the feature of actually backward control but of all the infinitival structures. So they all occurred either, yeah, they, they all occurred either in the beginning or in the middle of the matrix clause. But I'm not sure of what it says, and of course I'm not sure for other languages. So I cannot, uh, yeah, I, I cannot answer that for sure. But that requires to have a look <laughs> at what, yeah. Okay, uh, Maximilian Bunke. Do embedded fact propositions allow for the same word order variations as matrix clauses? Uh, I, you mean in general? <laughs> or, yeah, I'm particularly interested in embedded facts because topicalization is said to interact with the projection of effective presuppositions. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, this is a too to, to, to general in, in, in all languages of the world. <laughs> I cannot say for all that, of course. Uh, and even... Uh, I mean, uh, I think this, uh, this question can, should be... Um, answered uh, separately for each language and there's no general knowledge of this. However, of course, there's Diesel and schmidt Kubodis project and uh, works on publications on um, different types of complements and the word order variations in them. But I don't think they oppose uh, facts to propositions and check this. So, I, I don't think there's an answer to this question. Um, right? No. Michael Daniel, uh, he saw him not to approach the wall. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I understand what you, what you mean by this uh, inserting the negation. Uh, of course, uh, that's a problem um, shown by many people. Well, many people say that, okay, the events don't take negation, the negation, uh, and uh, he saw him enter is good, while he saw him not enter is weird in many languages. But there are other people who say that he saw him not enter is also possible and uh, give examples from the corpus. But then there's a large polemics about that and, um, the first kind of people say that uh, actually there are a specific type of mm, negated e negative events like you cannot uh, just put negation in any sentence of that kind uh, for example you cannot say he saw him not 
um, not running. It can, also, it can only occur in the situation when he was supposed to be running, or it, it for example, it take such a sentence as, he saw the child uh, not eating his porridge. In that case, uh, it is supposed somehow that the child should eat the porridge and uh, that it's, it's, it's an obligation. And, uh, or he saw the child not dressing. Uh, and this is possible in many languages because uh, the speaker should clearly uh, see the situation where the child is, uh, where two um, possible situations are posed. The situation of obeying to the parents, the situation of not obeying. And uh, the situation of not obeying involves this not dressing and not eating the porridge. And in, in this case, this not obeying kind of creates uh, a single unit. So it's not uh, just adding negation to an event, but it's a, kind, a case of a negative event. And there have been some formal analysis of this. So that, that, that's the answer to that question. Right, and the second question by Michael Daniel. Um, you said that no facts are not propositions in some languages. Is there evidence that in some languages it does not? Yes, it is. In, in English, for example, uh, we can say, I, I don't know that um, something, right? I don't know that um, John uh, make this, made this assignment, right? Uh, so in Russian, uh, this is ruled out. So it's really weird, such an example. If you pronounce it in Russian, you just um, hear that it's not good. That in English, it's possible. And based on this fact, the authors claim that no, it is not effective verb in English, but a semi-effective. Uh, so for English, the true effective verbs are regret. Uh, and some other emotive verbs that clearly um, uh, don't change the truth value of their uh, argument clause. And um, in this case that I illustrated, um, I don't know that uh, John made this assignment. Uh, th this is used uh, well, uh, and explained uh, like like I don't believe it. So actually, in English, the verb "no" uh, has the sub meaning "believe," uh, which he doesn't have in Russian, and it seems that he doesn't have it in some other languages as well. But in Adigya, for example, uh, he can also uh, this verb can also shift towards "believe." Uh, and uh, take the strategy associated with this meaning. So not effective form, but uh, the um, so-called adverbial case in L. So yeah, and now the continuation by Peter Arkady. No is believe something. No is, yeah, should I read it? The same question as Misha, actually, no is believe something that is assumed to be true in the current discourse. Um, I, I don't know whose definition is that. <laughs> so one can imagine a language that does not distinguish lexically between no and believe. However, I don't see how no can take something that is not a fact. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. There are languages that don't distinguish between know and believe, maybe, or just uh, like in English, know can sometimes denote believe and believe always denotes believe, right? So, yeah, but there are languages that, uh, where know is more limited and you cannot say, I don't know that because in that sentence you contradict yourself. If uh, know in, in, in a specific language is a uh, true effective, then it wouldn't uh, allow for such a construction because if you know something, you cannot say that you don't know it. 
so this could be a test uh, for activity of no. But actually, this uh, polemics uh, is something that uh, goes beyond my talk, and this is the polemics uh, of uh, where is activity situated in the semantics of the complement clause or in the semantics of the matrix verb. And uh, it's a large, uh, there's a large discourse in literature about that. <laughs> now, uh, Aigul Zakirova, I was wondering about slide uh, 27, the example about the donkey. The girl heard the donkey shout. There was contrast between the embedded verbs and contrast between the matrix verbs. Uh, well, to, to return this, I need to share my screen because I, I don't remember the actual forms uh, of the verbs. So, of course, uh, you need to you need to stop sharing your screen for me to return to. Okay. The, Right, so we have, ah, and that was the, 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 the perfect, yeah, the attributive here. Yeah, the use of the attributive in Sahur uh, independent sentences is um, a point, uh, yeah, it, it's a, a very interesting point of Sahur grammar and it's um, described um, in the reference grammar and it is very peculiar. Uh, so it has to do with the information structure, uh, something about thetic sentences, the differentiation between thetic and uh, uh, sentences with topic and comment. And uh, this is a long story. Uh, and But apparently uh, it, it has nothing to do with the uh, use of, with the marking of the complement clause, actually. So, um, of course, to make it a re good or minimal pair, we should have um, the same form everywhere, but uh, I mean, I just uh, take what I have <laughs> uh, from the grammar. Uh, and uh, you can just believe uh, the, my, my word and uh, the author's word that it doesn't matter here. So I'm stopping. Yeah. Can, can you come back to the questions, please? Timur Maisak, uh, naive question may be, how in examples with convertible clauses, like those given on slide 33, can we distinguish between complements and verbal clause? Yeah, I think it's not a naive question. Uh, I, I think and I guess that um, the recent uh, research on U2 also uh, encountered the same problem. And I also um, don't know how to, to answer actually this question. I think we need some syntactic evidence uh, to, to show it, uh, to show that actually uh, some um, verbs are adverbial clauses and some some of them are complements and I when I worked on Dagua I tried to find this evidence but I don't exactly remember um, I don't uh, now I cannot now uh, describe the results and uh, I think it's quite a tricky test uh, tricky question and actually uh, one of one of the problem is that um, you should first check whether this particular verb can be used um, without the complement clause. So uh, if it can be omitted at all. And there are arg other arguments like anaphoric binding that could also help to distinguish. So it, it's, it's, it's really a tricky, tricky point here. <laughs> Johanna Matilson, is there evidence for grammaticalization of verificative? Um, 
well, uh, actually, there, there's evidence that it's a morphological marker because, uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, but, but uh, you should really look at the original paper uh, because, uh, well, I, I know uh, that uh, uh, it's, it, it is itself um, inflex, so it takes the potential marker, for example. Um, um, and um, the, the word is pronounced as one and the same word, uh, but I don't remember well if there is, um, if there is um, morphology, if there are morphological changes uh, in between the verificative and the previous morpheme. So I, I must uh, address you to Marina Chumakina's paper on that. Mm. Now, uh, Ken Keys, I'm sorry, could you clarify what you mean by style languages? Standard average European is, has been postulated, um, uh, I think, first in Eurotip uh, uh, volumes. Uh, to indicate some well, some kind of standard. Ah, yeah, thank, thank you. P Peter said that there's a paper by Timur Maisak on verificatives. Yeah, thank you, I didn't know about that. Uh, and, um, well, th there's some idea of how um, actually European languages behave, and uh, this is usually uh, this abbreviation is usually used for this. Now, uh, Sara Dopirala, just to make sure I understood correctly for slide 47. Does this mean uh, the verificative is sort of its own form in the sense that it doesn't fall under another label? Uh, and it's somehow different from a regularly inflecting finite word. Uh, in that the verificative isn't necessarily just a verbal inflection of sorts. Yes, it's different from a regularly inflecting finite word because it doesn't take the whole range of the uh, of, of the verbal categories um, that uh, are usually taken by verbs in this language, uh, and it doesn't claim, for example, uh, mark. Um, it doesn't. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, so I won't, I won't mention <laughs> the particular features. So it's, 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 it has a reduced paradigm, and um, it's not uh, an inflecting finite verbs. Prosodically, it's also separate. It's not separate from the, um, the verb that's on the left. Uh, now, uh, you're saying it's sort of its own form. What do you mean semantically or morphosyntactically? Uh, it, it doesn't fall under another label because it seems, well, first, uh, why does it, it doesn't fall under another label? Because it's, uh, it does not require the matrix verb, unlike Mazda converts and infinitives. So uh, it's definitely outside of the um, of what we expect complementizers to be. So complementizer is, is expected to occur in the presence of a matrix verb of some kind. And this verificative occurs without any matrix verb. So it's a morpheme, but still it has, uh, it can assign case to its own arguments. Verificative. Uh, so that, that's why it doesn't fall under another label. As for the semantics, uh, maybe it's similar to uh, dubitative markers in some languages, but uh, I, I don't know um, uh, why uh, Marina doesn't use this term dubitative. Maybe because it differs in its uh, semantic distribution. So. I'm not ready to, to, I'm not sure about this. So may, there, there may be some, there, there must be some uh, reply, but uh, I didn't work on Archie, so I don't know. 
Okay, thank you very much. Now, should I read the comments as well? Uh, um, Natalia Vadimovna, thank you very much, but uh, I think uh, our time is up. Okay. Um, well, um, uh, the rest of the comments, uh, uh, I think, uh, may be answered or discussed uh, offline uh, through some other means. Uh, I think it's not a problem. And uh, finally, uh, I'd like to thank the audience uh, for participating uh, and for asking questions. Uh, we hope to see you again next week uh, at the last lecture of our course on relativization by Dr. Yuri Lander. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the attention. And see you in the next lecture.